What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network here for a reading of the Bitcoin Optech Group newsletter. Thank you very much to all the principals and associates, as well as the founding sponsors of this great open source organization. Today, newsletter number 51 on June 19th, 2019. This week's newsletter requests testings on release candidates for both LND and C Lightning, describes using elliptic curve Diffie Hellman for uncoordinated Lightning Network payments summarizes a proposal to add information about delays to Lightning Network routing replies, and includes summaries of some interesting talks from the recent Breaking Bitcoin conference in Amsterdam. Also included are our regular sections on BAC32 sending support and notable changes in popular Bitcoin infrastructure projects. Action items. Help test C Lightning and LND release candidates for both C Lightning and LND are in the process of testing release candidates for their next releases. Experienced users of either program are encouraged to help test the release candidates so that any remaining bugs can be identified and fixed before the final release. News using elliptic curve Diffie Hellman for uncoordinated Lightning Network payments. Stefan Snegirov sent two ideas to the Lightning Network development list in a single post. The first idea involving reusing an existing part of the protocol to enable spontaneous payments. A payment that Alice sends to Bob without her needing to request an invoice from Bob. As described in Newslander 30, they are currently proposed for LD by having Alice select a pre image, encrypt it to Bob's pub key and put it into an otherwise unused part of the Lightning Network routing package when Alice pays the hash of the pre-image. When Bob receives the encrypted pre-image, he decrypts it and releases it in order to claim the payment. Snigarov's idea eliminates the need to route the encrypted pre-image. He notes that the routing a payment from Alice to Bob already requires them to have a common shared secret, derived using elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman. The secret can be hashed once to produce a unique pre-image known to both of them. And that pre-image can be hashed again to be the payment hash. To use the system whenever Bob receives a payment to hash that he did not create an invoice for, he simply generates a double hash of the session's shared secret and sees if it matches. If so, he generates the single hash and claims the payment. C Lightning developer Christian Decker has written a proof of concept patch and plugin for C Lightning that implements this. Snegarov's second idea allows an offline device, such as a vending machine, to generate a unique Lightning Network invoice that can be paid by an online user to another online node that knows how to, pro how to produce the pre-image and claim the payment on behalf of the offline device. The results in the payer receiving the pre-image as proof of payment. The payer can then show this proof to an offline device to receive the promised good or service, such as the food from a vending machine. Again, the user share the, again, this uses a shared secret derived using elliptical curve Diffie Hellman, but in this case, the secret is shared between the offline device that generates the invoice and the online node that ultimately receives the payment. See Snegorov's post for the proposal uh, protocol details. Authentication messages about Lightning Network delays. When a payment fails in Lightning Network, it's often possible for a node attempting to the payment to receive an authenticated message from one of the nodes involved in the payment failure. This allows the paying node to mark the channel between those two nodes as unreliable and choose other channels for future payments. But LD developer Yoast Jager notes that the Lightning Network development mailing list that non ideal payment attempts can also be successful payments for which it took a long time to receive the success message. He proposed that each node relaying a message back to the paying node add two timestamps to the message one timestamp when the node offered to route a payment, and one timestamp where it learned either that a payment had failed or that it succeeded. This would allow the paying node to determine where delays occurred during the routing of a payment and avoid those channels in the future. To prevent some nodes along the path from lying about other nodes, he proposed 
the error message and timestamps are protected by a message authentication code. This could also prevent intermediate nodes from corrupting encrypted error message from endpoint nodes. Jager's proposal also discusses how this type of system could be implemented in the current routing protocol and how it could address concerns related to routing privacy. The protocol has received a moderate amount of positive discussion on the mailing list so far. Breaking Bitcoin. Breaking Bitcoin was a Bitcoin technology conference that took place in Amsterdam last weekend. It was well attended by both Bitcoin protocol developers and application engineers. Videos of the Saturday and Sunday are available, as are several transcripts by Bitcoin developer Brian Bishop at Kanzur. The following talks may be of particular interest to reader of the Bitcoin Optech News Network. Breaking Bitcoin Privacy by Chris Belcher, creator of the CoinJoin implementation Join Market, gave an overview of the privacy in Bitcoin. Belcher has previously written a literature review on process, and this very acceptable talk touched on many of the topics in this re review. He started by explaining why privacy is important in Bitcoin, described some commonly used heuristics used by chain analysis companies to link Bitcoin addresses and transactions, and demonstrates how coin joins and pain joins can be used to break those heuristics and thwart chain analysis. He finished by talking about how layer two technologies, such as Lightning Network, have the potential to improve privacy since they remove privacy leaking data from the blockchain. Bitcoin build system security. Chain Code Labs engineer Coil Dong gave a pre recorded presentation on building security in Bitcoin Core and then answered audience questions over video link. Dong's talk addressed the question If I download a Bitcoin Core executable from bitcoincore.org, and how can I know what code I am running? The Bitcoin Core project currently uses reproducible Gitian builds to ensure that the build binary corresponds to the source code. But Dong explains that reproducibility is not enough. If the reproducibility build toolchain uses pre-compiled binaries, then those toolchain binaries could be compromised and used to undetectably insert malicious code into the compiled binary. Dong went on to describe reproducibility and bootstrappable builds, where the number of pre-compiled binaries used in the toolchain is reduced to a minimum. And then he gave an update on his project to integrate GUIX, pronounced geeks, builds into the Bitcoin core to minimize trust in the build toolchain. Secure protocol on BIP taproot. Blockstream engineer Jonas Nick gave an update on some of the work he and his colleagues have been doing to build secure protocols using Schnorr signatures and the taproot constructions. He started by explaining how the proposed BIP taproot works and they explained some practical considerations when building the protocol using Schnapp, Schnorr and taproot. External signers that cannot leak private keys through nonce biases key aggregation and threshold signatures using music and blind signature aggregation, blind Schnorr signatures. As the Schnorr and Taproot proposal develops and maybe approaches activation, uh, companies that wish to take advantage of the new functionalities offered by this protocol need to consider these pr practical aspects of building secure products and protocols. Extracting seeds from hardware wallets. Ledger Chief Security Officer Charles Guillemet gave an eye-opening talk about the security issues with several hardware wallets on the market. He spoke about previously revealed exploits that he and his team have discovered, as well as new exploits for which he did not give the method in order to protect users. The attacks described use a mixture of physical access, site channels, and exploiting insecure cryptography implementations. This was a fascinating talk for anyone working with or using the hardware wallet to protect their Bitcoin. Cryptographic vulnerabilities in threshold wallets. One of the most hotly anticipated aspects of Schnorr signatures is the ability to implement key aggregation and threshold signature schemes. Similar schemes are possible, although much more complex to implement, using the ECDSA signing algorithm, which is currently used in Bitcoin. 
Zengo co-founder Omer Shlomovitz described some of those elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, key aggregation and threshold signature schemes and allowed and showed how many of the implementations for those schemes contain bugs due to faulty assumptions when optimizing the algorithm. Back 32 is sending support. Week 14 of 24 in a series about allowing the people you pay to access all of SegWit's multiple benefits. There's a class of multi-sig users who do not save on fees by using Back32 addresses, but who also receive improved security against a potential type of attack called a hash collision. This class of user include many exchanges and other business users. To provide some background, all combo single SIG addresses on Bitcoin today are the result of a pub key being tuned, turned into a 160-bit RIPEMD hash digest. It is theoretically possible for an attacker to generate a second public key that they control, hash it, and produce the same address. However, if we assume that the hash function produce perfectly unpredictable outputs, then the chance of this happening with a 160-bit hash function like RIPEMD160 is 1 in 2 to the power of 160 for each pub key the attacker tries. For comparison, Bitcoin miners perform 2 to the 80 power hashing operations roughly every 5 hours as of this writing. The SHA-256 dehashing operation miners perform is not the same as used in the RIPEMD160 collision attack, so their equipment cannot be reproduced for that use. But we can use this as a reference rate for the number of brute force operations a real-world system can perform today, at great expense. At that, at that rate, an attacker that performs the 2 to the power of 159 operations necessary to have a 50% chance of success would take about 25 million times the estimated age of the universe so far. However, when multi-stake addresses are being used, the attacker may be one of the parties involved by generating one of the addresses and so may be able to manipulate what address is finally chosen. For example, Bob's sends his pub key to Mallory, expecting that Mallory will send her pub key back. Then he expects that they'll each put that pub key into a multi-sig script template, hash it into an address, and someone will deposit money into that address. Mallory instead takes the script template and Bob's pub key, inserts one of her pub keys without telling Bob about it, and hashes it into an address. This allows her to see the address that Bob will accept before Mallory has committed to using that pub key. Mallory can then compare this address to a database of addresses generated from scripts that pay only her. If there is a match, a collision, between two of the addresses, she sends that pub key back to Bob, waits for money to be deposited into that address, and then uses the script from her database to steal the money. If there is not a match, Mallory can try again with a different pub key over and over until she succeeds if we assume that she has unlimited time and resources. Although this seems like the same brute force attack described earlier, with a 1 in 2 to the power of 160 chance of a success per attempt, we have to consider the size of Mallory's database. If we imagine a database has 100 addresses, then each different pub key she tries has 100 in 2 to the power of 160 chance of success. Because it succeeds, it matches any one of the addresses in Mallory database. This type of attack is called a collision attack. There are several algorithms with different CPU and memory trade-offs for collision attacks. But the general rule of security researchers follow is that the collision attack against a perfect hash function reduces its security to be the square root of its number of combinations. That is, it halves its size in bits. That means we can roughly assume that RIPEMD160 security is reduced to 80 bits, which is the same number of operations we mentioned Bitcoin miners perform every five hours today using current existing technology. Again, Bitcoin mining equipment cannot be used for this attack and for an attacker to describe and build enough custom equipment to find a collision in five hours might cost them billions of dollars. 
but it is theoretically possible attack that should concern those storing large values in pay to script hash, especially a custom hardware gets faster and cheaper. It's also possible that there are variations on the collision attack that are easier and cheaper to execute because of weaknesses in RIPEMD160 function. It is possible to design multiple setup protocols so that they do not have the problem and so that their collision resistance remains at 160 bits. However, the developer of SegWit believed that it was better to use a slightly longer hash function for SegWit's pay to script hash analog, pay to witness script hash, so that users did not need to worry about these cryptographic particulars. For that reason, SegWit pay to witness script hash uses the same SHA 26 d function used elsewhere in Bitcoin that provides 256 bit security for simple parity cases and 128 bit worst case security in multi party use cases. To the continue our rough comparison, if we consider 80 bits to be equivalent of five hours of Bitcoin mining, 128 bit is equivalent of 160 billion years of mining. Before we conclude this section, we do not we do want to ensure a few things are clear. One, we think it is unlikely that anyone today has the ability to execute the attack described, but we cannot rule it out as a risk. Two, the attack can only be used at the time addresses are being created, although the actual theft could occur a long time afterwards. Three, the attack only applies to multi-party multi-signature addresses. If you're a single SIG, single party using pay to script hash multi-sig with only your own trusted devices, or you're using pay to script hash, pay to witness script hash, single SIG addresses, there's no need to use from uh, to you from there's no risk to you from this attack. And four, the attack applies to pay to script hash wrapped SegWit pay to witness script hash addresses, as well as regular pay to script hash addresses. To eliminate the risk, we have to use native SegWit back 32 addresses or a secure key exchange protocol. To summarize, users of multi-party multi-sig who want the utmost in security should be migrating to back 32 pay to witness script hash addresses to take advantage of the extra collision resistance. As users make the migration, it will become even more important for services to ensure that they've implemented back 32 sending support so that they can send payments to those security conscious users. Notable code and documentation changes this week in Bitcoin Core, LND, C Lightning, Eclair, Lipsec P, and the Bitcoin improvement proposals. This Bitcoin Core change allows the import multi RPC to derive specific private keys using an output script descriptors and the then import the resultant keys. This Bitcoin Core change fixes the transaction relay bug introduced in this change, where a node would sometimes stop receiving any new mempool transactions, despite having a good connection to other nodes. See newsletter 43 for details and previous migrations, uh, or this change for an excellent description of the bug and initially proposed solution. This LND change adds support for altruistic watchtowers and clients. Watchtowers see and breach remedy transactions, justice transactions, on behalf of the clients that are currently offline to ensure that those clients' counterparties cannot steal any money. The ideal watchtower for general deployment is incentivized to do this by receiving modest monetary rewards for sending remedy transactions, but managing these incentives adds complexity. So, this initial version of the version of the complete system uses a simple altruistic watchtower that does not receive any rewards via the protocol, but otherwise provides both the client and server components for complete enforcement. You can set up a watchtower for your own channels, or you can use the watchtower or reliable friends. All the configuration parameters necessary are documented in LND's runtime help. Developer Willow Bjorn also has an example tutorial that helps you set up watchtowers, attempt to breach a test channel, and then observe the watchtower protect that channel's funds. This LND change adds support for RBF and child pays for parent a fee bumping when Lightning Network Daemon is sending sweep transactions using one of more of its on-chain UTXOs. 
This LND change allows users to integrate LND with the Prometheus monitoring solution for collecting statistics and sending alerts. The Seed Lightning change adds the new RPC that can be used to open a channel using funds from an external wallet. The Fund Channel Start RPC starts opening a new channel with a specific node and returns the VAC32 address that the external wallet should pay using only SegWit inputs with and without broadcasting the transaction. When a transaction has been created, its serialized form can be provided to the Fund Channel Complete RPC to securely finish the channel negotiation and broadcast the transaction. Alternatively, the fund channel RPC, fund channel cancel RPC can be called uh, to abort the channel setup before funds are sent. Because most external wallets will broadcast transactions automatically, these options need to be enabled explicitly using a configuration option. But they make it possible for external wallets to better integrate with C Lightning directly. The C Lightning change limits the amount of gossip requested by only requiring gossip from a subset of all nodes' peers. This continues to work across all major Lightning Network implementations of trying to reduce the amount of data sent via gossip now that the network has grown to thousands of peers. This C Lightning change extends the fund channel RPC with a new UTXO parameter that allows the user to specify which of the UTXOs from C Lightning's build in wallet to use to fund a new channel. This C Lightning change adds a new list transactions RPC method that lists all the on chain transactions created by the program and what they were used for setup, unilateral close, mutual close, or anti cheat. Others change, other changes in this pull request ensure that all the necessary data to provide the result is stored in the database. And this Eclair change allows Eclair to search through gossiped node announcement to find the IP address of channel peers uh, by their pub key in cases any peer gets disconnected and has its IP address changed. This BIP uh, Adds back 30 or this BIP 136 adds back 32 encoded transaction positions within the blockchain. For example, the position identifier of the first transaction in the chain, the Genesis Blocks generation transaction, is TX1 RQQ QQQ QMHU QHQ. The idea was the first proposed to the Bitcoin core to the Bitcoin dev mailing list over two years ago with suggested use cases, including identifying which transaction contains information useful to third-party applications, such as timestamped decentralized identity references. Piers, you got to subscribe to the Bitcoin Optech newsletter. And again, thank you very much to the founding sponsors, principals, and associates of this great open source organization. Thank you very much for your financial support on the Tallycoin and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.